Coming up, hundreds of volunteers who are part of the Andean Condor Conservation Project. The UK lays claim to the beefiest bullock in the world. Tourists flock to Kenya to witness the spectacle of over 1.4 million migrating wildebeest. A hard-working hound that won a bravery award for saving lives. And an orphan baby elephant searching for a new home. Around 150 years after Andean condors disappeared from the Patagonian region of Argentina, five took flight over the mountains recently when biologists released them as part of a conservation effort. Hundreds of volunteers who are part of the Andean Condor Conservation Project trekked up the Sierras de Palamon, some 1150 kilometers south of Buenos Aires. But before they could watch the young condors make their first flight from captivity, the local shamans celebrated an age-old religious ritual. Condor plumes and feathers are symbolically cast from the top of the mountain. And then finally, it was time to set the birds free. The condors who were released included a one-year-old female named Guaitamari and two-year-olds Wichi, Marlin, Malki and Poima, two males and two females. All five condors were raised in the Buenos Aires Zoo as part of the conservation program. The program, sponsored by the zoo and the Argentine Bio-Andean Foundation, began in 1991 and has so far successfully released 35 birds throughout South America. Prior to this release, the director of the Andean Condor Conservation Project, Luis Yacomi, together with 40 dedicated volunteers, combed through more than 2,000 kilometers of the Atlantic coast looking for the best area to release the young condors. The location they finally settled on is situated some 50 feet from the ocean. Scientists are able to monitor the birds' progress and adaptation to their new environment via satellite transmitters attached to their wings. Condors generally lay only one egg every two or three years, although the zoo has had some success in producing multiple eggs. Biologists extract the first egg from the birds early in the process and, as a result, they're often likely to lay a second egg within the following month. After two months, they help the chick to hatch. The baby condors are put into a nursery where they have daily contact with humans who care for them and feed them, while a hand puppet is used to simulate the natural actions of a mother condor in the wild. So far, all of the births and subsequent hand rearing of the young chicks has been successful, according to the zoo. After leaving the nursery, the birds are brought into contact with other young condors for six months and finally put into the release program. Now begins the process of tracking them through satellite technology as they return to the sea to feed and resume life here, a century and a half after their ancestors disappeared from these very same parts. The Wild Care Africa Trust outside Pretoria, South Africa, is one of the largest rehabilitation centers of its kind. Currently, it's caring for nearly 250 animals, including a record 19 rhinoceros, of which four are black rhino, one of the world's most endangered species. Wild Care is one of the very few centers that has Before the capacity here, no. and the facilities <laughs> to handle large game and are usually inundated with cases. There's been an explosive growth in the wildlife industry in recent times, especially in the trade and movement of rhino. This has resulted in a large number of casualties, and large numbers of animals are being affected by stress from the constant moving and translocation and all that's involved within these activities. This year, in addition to the usual variety of animals in need of medical assistance, 
the center has seen an unprecedented influx of rarer species. So the wildlife center yes, required you? extra aid, which has come from the International Fund for Animal Welfare, which in turn has called upon the assistance of members of its international emergency relief team to support the round-the-clock hey, rehabilitation work at Wildcare. Fortunately for the IFAW, a number of specialist veterinarians and biologists on its international emergency relief team could arrive on call and were able to step in at short notice to offer the wild care team some much needed backup. Because many of the animals requiring treatment are amongst the last of their kind on the planet, IFAW was more than willing to offer assistance when the call came. Kenya's tree-dotted Maasai Mara is usually one of East Africa's most popular tourist destinations. At this time of year, tourists and wildlife enthusiasts flock here to witness the spectacle of over 1.4 million migrating wildebeest, accompanied by hundreds of thousands of zebras. The herds are visiting from the Serengeti in Tanzania, the starting point from which they migrate in a clockwise fashion for almost 2,000 miles every year in search of rain, ripe and grass. But in reality, there's no real beginning or end to a wildebeest journey. Life is an endless pilgrimage, a constant search for food and water. Since the rains came late to the Mara this year, the numbers of wildebeest in the Mara by mid-August are far less than usual. But Mohammed Nur, who's shown tourists around the Mara for over 14 years, says there's nothing to worry about, except if you're a wildebeest, that is. Wildebeest are extremely unpredictable. Anyone keen on seeing the creatures in action can have a generous portion of patience along with their binoculars. Many of them do make it across the treacherous waters safely, however. If they can outwit the Mara's cheetahs, hyenas, leopards, and lions that have been eagerly awaiting their arrival, they'll be back here in four months trying to get to the replenished pastures of the Serengeti. The Maasai people of Kenya have hunted and led their cattle on the plains of the Mara for generations. Even centuries ago, the arrival of the wildebeest was good news. These Maasai warriors make a bit of extra money entertaining tourists keen on learning more about their culture. When it's feeding time at this farm in Somerset, Farmer Arthur Duckett and his helper have their hands full. Not because there are many mouths to feed, but rather because there's one very big mouth waiting. They call him the Colonel, and proud owner Arthur Duckett reckons he's the beefiest bullock in the world. He's six foot five inches and weighs 1,660 kilos. That's heavier than a BMW, and as big as a small elephant. And an awful lot of burgers if you want to think about the colonel in that way. This big bull's become a star attraction at Arthur's Farm, which doubles as a wildlife park at Alston near Burnham, Somerset in England. Arthur bought the Holstein six years ago and has watched him pile on the pounds ever since on a diet of hay, oats, barley and nuts. The previous record was held by a steer called Old Ben, who died in Indiana in 1910 at 4,720 pounds. Now there's only one dark cloud on the horizon for the Colonel, who's just turned eight. UK government BSE restrictions forbidding the slaughter of cattle over 30 months old are soon to change, and he could face the chop. He'd probably feed a whole town. But don't worry, Arthur's grown quite fond of the Colonel. He'll be staying right where he is, free to keep on growing. And from one end of the scale to the other, miniature horses to put into a miniature stable. You can't ride them and you can't race them, but these mini horses are equine in all things except for size. Bred to be tiny and good-natured, they're the latest pets of wealthy Russians who are buying their way into an American tradition of small-scale horse breeding. Not to be confused with ponies, which are generally larger, these horses were originally bred to work in American mine shafts, where the height of less than a meter was an advantage in the cramped spaces. Prices vary depending on appearance, breeding, and various other factors. 
but the average mini horse will cost about $15,000 or more than a hundred times the average monthly salary in Russia. It's yet to be seen whether Russians will take to these tiny equines. But according to horse trainer Sergei Ivanov, who looks after this mini herd a few hours east of Moscow, they're becoming a must-have accessory for the showbiz set and even some well-known politicians. But he can't reveal who. During the wintertime in the United States, some 3,000 West Indian manatees migrate to the warmer waters in Florida. Although the water temperatures in Florida seas are much warmer, it's not always warm enough for the manatees, and unfortunately, they succumb to frostbite. The state of Florida has three official critical care units to treat injured manatees, including a facility at the Lowry Park Zoo in Tampa, Florida. Last year, the Lowry Park facility treated some 17 injured manatees. The idea is to treat them, return them to full health, and release them out to the wild. To date, the hospital has cared for more than 125 manatees. Although sunbathers may find refuge in Florida during the wintertime, once the water drops below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, manatees are at risk of frostbite, which causes their skin to fall off and eventually may lead to death. Although the weather may prove problematic for the manatees, the seas are also a threat to these creatures. They are often struck by boats, crushed in canal locks, swallow fish hooks, or are caught in crab trap lines. They may also succumb to a virus called red tide. Manatees have been declared an endangered species since 1973. About 8% of the population is lost each year. There are approximately 2,600 West Indian manatees left in the United States today. Manatees look something like an overgrown seal. Their closest land relative is an elephant, and unlike dolphins or seals, manatees don't have many layers of fat, and they carry weight more akin to humans. Treatment for manatees with frostbite involves feeding the animal with a thick, milky solution, which is a combination of vitamins and antibiotics. The solution is fed through their nose via a plastic tube at least once a day. Their skin is washed and scrubbed thoroughly, and their scars are treated with a mixture of iodine to help close their wounds. This daily cleansing and maintenance of scar tissue ensures the animal's survival and prevents further infection from antibodies and bacteria. At the Lowry Park Zoo, it costs $300 a day just to feed the manatees, and they eat up more than half of the zoo's $10 million budget. But the efforts are well worth it. The caretakers at Lowry Park simply treat the animals, making no effort to befriend the creatures. The idea is to make sure the manatee leaves as wild as when it first arrived, and that its behavior hasn't been affected by the treatment. Initially, manatees are kept in small treatment pools, and are later moved to a larger pool with a glass viewing center. Here, they're observed for a period of time in which is their final testing ground before they're ready for release. Manatees can live up to 60 years. On average, one calf is born every two to five years. The gestation period is about a year, and mothers nurse their young for one to two years. Manatees have no natural enemies, and most mortalities are human-related. These manatees will eventually be released into the wild. However, their survival is wholly dependent on their migration patterns next winter. Let's hope that these peaceful creatures won't ever have to face the nasty cold again. A British army dog was awarded the animal equivalent of the Victoria Cross at London's Imperial War Museum recently. Buster, a six-year-old Springer Spaniel, broke a resistance cell in Safwan, southern Iraq, when he discovered a hidden cache of weapons and explosives. Buster received the Dickin Medal from Princess Alexandra at a reception held by the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals and is the 60th animal to receive the award. During the search of one Iraqi house, 
Buster very quickly gave his handler a positive indication while staring at a wardrobe. The soldier who'd searched the building earlier had not discovered anything, but Sergeant Morgan trusted his dog's instincts. A large cache of explosives, weaponry and drugs was soon uncovered. Buster is considered responsible for saving the lives of countless civilians and troops. While all may look serene at Thailand's oasis SeaWorld, park management and staff have been left a little hot under the collar. Environmental groups have alleged that the marine park illegally exported six wild-caught dolphins to Singapore. Forestry police, Thai non-government organisations and Singaporean environmentalists joined forces to raid the oasis SeaWorld in Chantaburi, about 250 kilometres east of Bangkok. The park keeps 19 dolphins in a series of exhibition and training pools. 12 Irrawaddy and 7 pink dolphins, also known as Indo-Pacific humpbacks. While both species are protected, it's not illegal to keep or export them if they've been captive bred. General Suwek Pinsinchai, commander of the Thai Forestry Police Division which led the raid, said they would ask for the dolphins back if it was proved that they'd been caught in Thai waters. Oasis SeaWorld owner Wee Chai Watanapong declined to go into details of the sale, saying he would need time to check all the documents, but doubted that a mistake had been made. Conservationists involved with the raid also claimed that the SeaWorld pools were badly designed for keeping dolphins. The thick concrete walls disrupt the aqualocation system that the dolphins use to communicate with each other. Whenever they send off a signal, it simply bounces off the walls and comes straight back to their ears. The past two months have seen dozens of such raids on zoos, markets and private homes. Over 33,000 protected animals have been seized by police in Thailand's efforts to smother its reputation as a regional hub for illegal trade in endangered animals. The pink dolphin, for example, is listed among the world's most endangered species. Wildlife Friends of Thailand reflect the wishes of many conservation groups by not only wanting to see the end of the illegal capturing of wild dolphins, but the dismantling of marine amusement parks as well. If, by some chance, the six wild-caught dolphins are returned from Singapore and repatriated back to Thailand, Wildlife Friends plan to return them to the ocean where they belong. A record number of migratory birds has arrived this year in Hokusar Wetland Reserve in India's troubled Jammu and Kashmir. The Hokera Sanctuary, 17 kilometers from the state's summer capital Srinagar, set in the breathtaking beautiful valley, serves as the natural winter habitat for some of the rare and exotic species of birds migrating southwards from the northern hemisphere. Bird watchers say around 300,000 birds of 14 species, including milad, geese, and shawlers, have arrived already. Experts believe that special care needs to be taken to ensure that these birds continue to arrive every year. Assistant Wildlife Warden Mohammedan Ramzan Dar explains that there's a lot of management involved. The water level must be kept low for most of the birds, while some areas need to be set aside for the deep divers. Wetlands are among the most important life support systems for the migratory birds, yet two-thirds of these lands in Kashmir have been destroyed since the 1950s and are in need of serious protection and preservation. Once the birds arrive, they fly in flocks searching for food. The Wildlife Authority does what it can by providing some seed for the tired and hungry visitors. During their six-month stay in India, the birds lay eggs and bring up their chicks until they're strong enough to undertake the long journey home. This is Ollie, a three-month-old orphaned elephant. He was found abandoned in a dry riverbed near Salibi Pikwi in northern Botswana. No one knows what happened to his mother or his herd. Ollie was rescued from Botswana by the Wildcare Africa Trust 
which negotiated with local wildlife authorities to move the baby elephant to their rehabilitation centre near Pretoria in South Africa. Wildcare is a wild animal rehabilitation centre noted for its work with rhinos, cheetahs and other big cats. When Ollie was found, he was only a few hours old and has had to be hand reared by the wildcare team. Now that he's been stabilised and is putting on sufficient weight, the decision was made to move him to a rehabilitation centre dedicated to caring for elephants. It's essential that he has the company of other calves of a similar age and will eventually be released with them into the wild in a safe and protected environment. While there were no other baby elephants for Ollie to bond with at Wildcare, he did make friends with an orphan baby rhino named Tunza. Finally, the day arrived for Ollie to leave. He was accepted by the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust based in Savo East National Park. It's the most successful elephant rehabilitation center in the world and the only one of its kind in Africa. Karen Trendler, founder of Wildcare and Ollie's main caregiver, will accompany him to his new home in Kenya. He had a bath yesterday afternoon. Some preparation. Packed snugly into his own custom-made travelling crate, designed to hold his whopping 120 kilogram frame and helped along by a low dose of tranquilizer, Ollie soon settles down for the ride. According to the International Fund for Animal Welfare, Ollie is indicative of the crisis facing elephants across Africa. In much of the continent, elephants continue to be under threat from poachers, mainly because ivory continues to be a prized commodity. The IFAW is slowly fighting back and has enlisted the help of the Battleurs, a group of pilots and aeroplane owners who donate their services in instances of animal welfare or environmental need. These kind-hearted volunteers have offered to fly Ollie to the Tsavo East National Park in Kenya and ultimately to freedom. There goes Ollie. I'm sure we all wish him a happy life. And I'd like to wish you all a happy life until we next meet again on Animalia. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next time.